Good morning, church. How are you doing? I hope you are all excited for today. Uh, it's my greatest privilege to deliver God's message this morning. But to be honest, back in April after our st staff meeting, Pastor Ronnie called me to his office. At first, I thought it's just our normal meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting together. But something, uh, he, he said something different. He said, Jody, you will be preaching upstairs in the main service in August. And I was like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? And I didn't really expect that. Take note, it's not a question if you, I want to speak. It's a command. Jody, you will be speaking. You have no choice. <laughs> but... At first, I was really scared about it, but when, as I prepare for this Sunday's sermon, God taught me about the truths that we'll be unpacking today. And it is this. When God calls you, He enables you. When God calls you, He goes with you. And when God calls you, he grows you. Thank you for that sound effect. <laughs> Perfect timing, look. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning that we're here. Father, you're really appointed that we're here right now. Father, we ask that we'll meet you right now. Father, we ask, Lord God, that you will open our hearts, soften our hearts. Help us to tune in and listen to your word. Remove anything that hinders us from really listening to your living word. Thank you for this morning. May we respond to you in the right manner. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today we will study the book of Jeremiah. So if you have your Bibles with you, open with me in Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah is one of the longest book in the Old Testament. 52 chapters, and it's also one of the least read book in the Old Testament. Maybe the reason is Jeremiah is known to be the weeping prophet, and his weeping and his cry, he did a lot of crying during his time because of the problems he witnessed uh, during his time. And probably the reason why a lot of people doesn't read it is because I don't need another problem while I read Jeremiah. But Jeremiah means God appoints. God appoints. And you can see that in the rest of the book because God called Jeremiah and appointed Jeremiah to deliver his message of judgment for Judah and Israel's apostasy. They forgot their covenant to God. They rebelled against God. They turned away from God. Now, how did Jeremiah respond to this task, to this calling? Let's take a look. Jeremiah chapter 1, 4 to 10. Verse 4, let's start with verse, verse 4. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, verse 4 started with the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. At first, it doesn't have some significance, but if you're going to think about it in an Old Testament thinking, the, whenever the word of the Lord came is mentioned in the Old Testament, it signifies that when God speaks, when He speaks, there's a dynamic, powerful, creative power in it. The best example of this is in Genesis 1, when God said, let there be, or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be, and the result was things that didn't exist came to existence. Hebrews 11.3, the author, made a commentary about this. 
And he says, by faith, we believe that the heavens and the earth were created by the word of God. God spoke creation. So when it says here that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, what it means that God's word has this creative, dramatic power. His words are so powerful that whoever receives it, whoever hears it, it will be life changing. It will be life changing. And when you think about it, that's how we're supposed to receive God's word. That's how we're supposed to approach our Bible, right? That's how we're supposed to read God's Word and study God's Word. What's supposed to be happening is when we open ourselves to God's Word, it will have a dramatic effect in our lives. And when we receive it and embrace it, it will change our lives. That's why our senior pastor keeps on telling us, you know, make sure that you, when you go out of this room, you will be changed. There's a change of heart. The, lo- the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Now, when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, it had this dramatic impact in his life. It changed his life because God revealed to him his divine purpose. And God revealed to him his divine purpose through these four praises before I formed you in the, in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. So these four phrases, I formed you, I knew you, I set you apart or I consecrated you, I appointed you. And you can see God is the subject of these phrases meaning he's the divine source of this revelation. Let's start first with I formed you. He's talking about Jeremiah in the mother's womb. It's the same word found in Genesis 2.7 2, when God said, you know, he's forming the man from the dust. It's the same word found in Jeremiah 18.2-4 when the potter is molding and shaping the pot to its perfect form molding, shaping. God formed and designed Jeremiah in his mother's womb. Back in the Old Testament, they probably have less information about what's happening during conception. But during this time, because of the work of our doctors, our technology, we have enormous information about what's happening inside the mother's womb. And when I was in college, back in, when I was in the Philippines, back in college, I studied nursing. So, some of you are probably like, what? <laughs> but um, during nursing, one subject that interests me the most is biology. And in biology, I was so amazed because when you study biology, you'll get into DNA. And when you take a look at DNA, you'll see form. You'll see design. You'll see the pattern. And in the trillion cells of our body, it has this DNA. It has this pattern. It has this design. And I'm not the smartest person in the room, but it's so easy. It's not hard to recognize that when you see this wonderful design, when you see, when you discover this beautiful picture of design, it's an easy step to see from design to designer. That there is a God behind all of these things, designing even the smallest particle of our body. God is claiming to be actively involved in creating a human being who previously didn't exist. Wow, what amazing and mind-blowing truth that is. Let me tell you why. A lot of us struggle with our self-identity. A lot of us ask the question, who am I? A lot of us ask the question, what am I here for? 
What's the purpose of my life? There's, that's the reason there's a lot of books written about this. We're struggling, struggling with our self-identity. And if you ask this question, can you give a nod? Yeah, to yourself. And we try to look the meaning to the ans- or the answer to these questions through our relationships with our family, with our spouses, with our workmates, with our friends. But here's the reality. We should not discover our own identity by looking, by finding it on the horizontal relationship. We start it out to discover our self-identity by looking vertically our relationship to God. That's the reality. We start out by doing it on the vertical relationship. Meaning, if you want to understand ourselves, if we want to know who you are, what's your purpose, we need to understand ourselves in the context of who God is. And it is this, that God is the maker of you. He is the designer of you. He's the creator of you. Then, that while you're still in your mother's womb, he's already forming, crafting, molding a beautiful piece of masterpiece. Wow. What an amazing truth that is. So God is telling to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I need you to understand this. I formed you. Jeremiah, I need you to understand another thing. I, don't, I didn't only form you, I knew you before you were formed, before you were born. Wow, what a mind-blowing uh, truth that is. What in the world happened before we were formed in our mother's womb? Well, according to God, he's not only involved in creating us, but he's also intimately involved in knowing about you and me before we were brought into existence. He's intimately involved in knowing you about me before we were even born. The verb here, to know. Long before you were born or even conceived, God thought about you, planned for each one of us. And the verb here to know is more than just, you know, knowing someone. I know Edwin, I know Richard. But here, it indicates a relationship, an intimate and close relationship. And when you're in that kind of relationship, you care for that person. Like what the psalmist said in Psalm 1, 6, for the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, meaning God is watching over and keeping safe the lives of the righteous one. And if you're going to read the whole book of Jeremiah, I'm telling you, Jeremiah really needs God's protection because he's constantly under attack, persecuted because of his calling. So God is assuring Jeremiah, I know you. I'm watching over you. I'm protecting you. It reminds me of this story or this tradition about the American Indian, Indians when they train their young ones. There's a story of this American Indian boy who just turned 13. After he learned hunting, fishing, scouting, he was put to his final test. And um, on, his, on the night of his 13th birthday, he was blindfolded and taken to the middle of the forest by himself, alone, and see if he will survive. So it was, this is the only time he was taken away from the security of his family and his home. So when he took his blindfold, he was in the middle of the forest and he was terrified because it's so dark. And every time a twig snapped, he was already imagining a wild animal ready to devour him. And what it seems to be a long night, he was like, alas, the sun shine, the sun revealed and brought light to the middle of the forest. He's, while he's walking, he saw the, the flowers, the trees, the path. But to his utter amazement, he saw a figure of a man a few feet away from him, armed with a bow and arrow. 
It was his father. He was there all night long, watching over and protecting him. Church, this is a reminder for each one of us that when God calls, there's an assurance of his divine protection. That he watches over us. Like Jeremiah, God is actively interested in our personal relationship with him. He watches every step of our way. Isn't that so encouraging? So God is saying, Jeremiah, I formed you. I knew you. Here's the other one, Jeremiah. I consecrated you. We can see here that God formulated each step of the process from conception to consecration. To, to consecrate means to be set apart, to be holy, to be set apart. God set Jeremiah apart, not because he's holy himself or he came from a priestly background, but because God set him apart for his own use. In order to be used by God, he, Jeremiah, God needs to set apart Jeremiah and be set apart from the world. Set apart to God and be set apart from the world. Because remember, during that time, the people, God's people, forgotten about God, forgotten their first love, disobeyed God, rebels against God, build their own idols, and worship different God. So God wants Jeremiah to be set apart, to be different than others. This is an aspect of commitment. If I'm going to use you, Jeremiah, you need to be committed to me alone on this specific assignment. And what's the specific assignment God called Jeremiah? We can find that on the next phrase. I have appointed you to be prophet to the nations. To be prophet to the nations. Long ago, a divine decision has made to set Jeremiah aside to belong to God and be used by God. And God given Jeremiah a specific task, a particular task, which is to be a prophet. He's, he won't be a priest like his father or his grandfather. He will be a prophet because a prophet is very different from a priest. A priest represents man to God, but a prophet represents God to man, meaning he will be an ambassador, a messenger, a mouthpiece of God. I believe the church today has a prophetic ministry in today's society. Even though God doesn't call each one of us to be like Jeremiah, to be a prophet and announce judgment or uh, prophecy, God wants us to engage, to participate in this prophetic activity, meaning God wants us to be his spokesperson, to be his mouthpieces of truth to every person that we're going to meet. In short, every Christian should be a truth teller, a truth teller of God's living word. Our brother Christopher said once in our staff meeting, he said, um, we Christians are like God's microphone. He empowers each one of us to amplify his living word to other people. We Christians are like God's microphone. He empowers each one of us to amplify his living word to other people. I think that's really too true. God is reminding us to have a loud voice, to speak out, not to be passive, but to act, to be active on amplifying the gospel in this world that's full of other voices. Can you tell to the person next to you, you are God's microphone? <laughs> Some of you are probably thinking, my mom doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> but we are God's truth teller of his living 
word. So Jeremiah is appointed to be a prophet, a prophet to the nations. That's what I really love about Jeremiah. It's close to our, not only to my heart, but our heart as a church, because this is our mission statement. Remember, IBC is God's home for the nations. It's the same calling. God wants Jeremiah to proclaim God's word, not only to Judah, not only to Israel, not only to the north, not only to the south, but all nations. He's God's messenger to the nations. He was designed purposely and appointed to a specific task of telling the truth about God to all people that he will meet. God formed Jeremiah, God knew Jeremiah, God set him apart, and God appointed him to be prophet to all nations. Church, I think the same God is the same God who's calling you this morning. It's the same God who's calling us, who's challenging us this morning. God is telling you, I formed you long before you took your first breath. I have plans for your life. You're not an accident. He knows you by name. He knows how long we're going to live. He knows all things we're created to be and to do. God designed each one of us and positioned purposely each one of us to where we are right now so that we can have this international mission of telling the truth, of telling the gospel to other people. Bringing other people to Christ. That is our calling. That is our calling as a Christian. And like Jeremiah, church, we shouldn't be afraid of this task. Because when God calls, He goes with us. When God calls you, He goes with you. He won't just leave you behind. Or you do your thing. No, he will go with us. Let's see what happens in verse 7. Well, if you're in Jeremiah's shoes and God told you, my child, I want you to tell the world about my judgment, how will you respond? You're probably, I don't think I'm the right person, God. How would you feel? You're probably scared, right? Well, when Jeremiah heard about what he's supposed to do, he's less excited about it. Jeremiah obviously was like overwhelmed about it. He realized how big God is and how big the task is, but he also realized how small he is, how inadequate and inexperienced he is. So let's see how Jeremiah responded. Jeremiah responded like this in verse 6. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am youth. As if Jeremiah is telling to God, Oh, good Lord, wait a minute. I don't know how to speak. First, I don't know how to speak. Second, I th I'm so young. I don't think I'm your guy. I'm clearly too young for this task. He responded by declaring his inadequacies. He protests about his limited communication skills. He confesses that he's trained, he's not trained to speak confidently and be prophet to all nations. As if he's saying, God, I don't even have a message for my own people. How much more or how much less to other nations, to all nations. So not only Jeremiah complained about his inadequacy, he also complained about his inexperience. He said he's too young. And during that time, he's probably in his late teens and early 20s. How could such a young person perform a big and dangerous task? So in Jeremiah's mind, it's either God will choose another prophet to proclaim his message or God will wait a little bit longer so his ability and social skills catch up. 
But that would miss God's point, right? That would miss God's point. Because God wants to show that in our human inadequacy and in our human inexperience, God can show his divine enablement. In our human inadequacy, in our human experience, God can show to us that he is sufficient. So, this is what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 12, that Christ's power is made perfect in our weakness. God meets us in our weakness. And it's very true. Sometimes we're like Jeremiah. We have a lot of, you know, when God calls us, we have a lot of excuses. We're too young. We're not that confident. Or probably we're too old. I don't think it's, it's still my time. Or probably we're going to say, oh, it's not my personality to go out there and just share the gospel about you. Or maybe it's not me. Maybe, oh, this guy, the pastor, or some other one will probably mo- much better than me. In our lives, sometimes God will call us to do tasks that's bigger than us. And at times we will feel incapable, inexperienced, inadequate like Jeremiah. For me... I experienced this last year when all the transitions and the changes that happened last year, I felt so overwhelmed and almost lost. But God is faithful because through God's reminder and his instruments of support, our pastors, our staff, our church, our parents, and even our young people, they reminded me not to forget the one who called me. And I believe God is reminding us also this morning, do not forget. Remember, it is God who's calling you this morning. It is God who's calling you this morning, the creator of heavens and the earth, the one who designed us, the one who knows our future is calling you this morning. And I believe that when he calls, he equips, he supplies, Look at how God reacted to Jeremiah's excuses. Verse 7. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord, what Jeremiah forgot here, that God has no limits. God rejected easily all Jeremiah's excuses of deficiency with his divine sufficiency. And here we can see two things that God promises. He promised his support. Jeremiah cannot say that he has no message to say because he will simply tell people what, her, what the Lord has given to him. He would be told what to say at the appropriate time. And the second promise he received from God is his presence, support, and presence. So if Jeremiah is afraid because he is young, he doesn't need to worry because he is assured of God's protection. God said, I am with you, Jeremiah. The one who sends Jeremiah will also be at his side. You know, I think one of the greatest promise or chapter about promise in the Bible is um, Psalm 23. It talks about God's support and presence. I remember when I was in sixth grade, I really hate public speaking. So the, I really hate it because Every time I go to the stage or go to in front of other people, I will end up crying. I don't know what dawned to my mother's mind. I don't know what came into her. She said, you know what? Let's push you to participate into public speaking contests. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. So he, <laughs> she, 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 she asked me to participate in the public speaking contest. And this is the passage, Psalm 23, 
she asked me to memorize it, to meditate on it. She even taught me the actions, the gestures on this chapter. And of course, when I came up, I was like so nervous about it. I was about to cry. But then I started, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. <laughs> he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then I go, even though I walk through the valley of shadows of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rat and your stuff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> And then I cried. <laughs> I like walking down the stage, I, I'm, I can't take it. I just like cried and bawl. <laughs> but here, God is reminding the, us that his support and his presence will be there when he calls us. That's why God said to Jeremiah in verse 8, Do not be afraid, Jeremiah. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. Is it so amazing how God keeps on mentioning this every time he calls someone? Fear not. Because when God calls us, fear is always the thing that gets on our way. Fear is one of the most paralyzing of human emotions that stop us from becoming who God wants us to be. Fear. We become victims of fear because sometimes we lack understanding about God's promises in the Bible or we lack faith that those promises are true. Rick Warren, Christian author, said, Fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God wants you to be. Fear is a self-imposed prison that will stop you from becoming what God wants you to be. And he continued like this. You must move against it with weapons of faith. Meaning the antidote or the remedy to fear is faith. Faith that God is in control. Faith that God has everything under his control, that he is with us, that he will deliver us. Faith. I think, church, we need to learn to exchange our fears with childlike faith. We need to learn to surrender and submit to our loving Father because I believe he can work in and through us if we will just obey him in faith. So church, fear not. When God calls you, fear not. Because when God calls you, he goes with you. You don't have to be afraid. Amen? Amen. And lastly, when God calls you, he grows you. God does the growing part. When you accept the invitation, God does the making part, the growing part in your Life. Verse 9 says, Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. This is the enablement of God. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you to this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. There's a lot of words in here, but you can divide this words into two categories. But first, these verbs are terms in agriculture. Pluck up, break down, destroy, overthrow, build, and plant. 
one category is destructive and the other one is constructive. The destructive terms are announcements of God's judgment and the constructive terms are messages of God's encouragement and hope. And I want you to take an, a look at here because this order is very important, not only to the God's people back there, back during that time, but also to our life. Because God needs to break down first and then build up. In relationship to his people, Judah and Israel's idols and their immoral practices need to, broke, to be broken down first before God can bless them. That's the reason why Jeremiah's message is not popular in those days because they don't want to listen to God's warning. They don't want to change. They, they're callous in their heart and they refuse to listen to God's calling. They disregarded God's message. But nothing is hidden from God. He saw the sins of Judah and the nations are certainly going to face judgment. And you can see this in the rest of the book in Jeremiah, even the book of Lamentations, where his people experienced suffering. They experienced the judgment of God through the people of Babylon. And here, God even allowed Jeremiah to witness this so that he will see that his words are true. God did this to warn not only the Jews, but all the nations of the world, of the world about his judgment on sin. Church, I believe we're included in the, this message of judgment and hope. As believers, I believe God is also telling us this morning not to disregard his message, not to neglect his calling. God is reminding us, I'm the one calling you this morning, not Jeremiah, not Jody. I am the one speaking to you this morning. God is the one calling you this morning and telling you, I want to grow you. I want to change you. I want to mold you. But in order to fulfill that, God needs to pluck up, to destroy, to break down, to overthrow things in our life that is not from Him. And maybe that's the question for you this morning. What are the things in your life that is not from Him? What are the things in your life you're doing over and over again that is not pleasing in His sight? God needs to break it down. God's word says what is corrupt, what is crooked, what is callous must be uprooted and torn down. For only then God can initiate to build and to plant anew. For only then God can use you. For only then God can bless you. And I want to illustrate that to you this morning through a skit. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece, his workmanship. I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning sometimes and look into the mirror, I don't see a masterpiece. But I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be his masterpiece. So I'll go to him in prayer and say, Dear Heavenly Father, mold me and do whatever it takes to mold me in the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Oh, who are you? I'm God. <laughs> no, you're not. Yes, I am. You said the prayer, so here I am. That's how it works. <laughs> all right, all right. If you're God, then 
Make it snow here in Singapore. You know, I don't really want to make it snow in here because it get kind of yucky. <laughs> See, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. Yes, I do. It's a Greek word. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> if you're God, then who's going to win the World Cup this year? You know, I'm, I'm not really into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. What gave it away? You answered my question with a question. I did? <laughs> huh. I do that, don't I? Ha! <laughs> did it again. All right, here we go. All right. All right. Wait, what are we doing here? I'm making you to my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Wait, where are those? <laughs> These are the tools I'm going to use to make you to my original masterpiece. Oh, uh, okay. Hang on, I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Uh, All I'm right, so here we go. <laughs> Wait, God, how will you know what to chisel and what to leave? Well, I take away anything in your life that's not supposed to be there. Kind of like dead weight. Speaking of dead weight, can you like chisel right here? <laughs> and like one line here, two lines here, three more lines here. That would be great. Uh, do you, you want to talk or can I chisel? No, no, no. no. Talk? Chisel, chisel, chisel. Most of my children like to talk. Not me. Bring on the chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. <coughs> I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. You compare yourselves to others instead of me. <coughs> you tell little white lies to be a people pleaser. <coughs> you're lazy. <coughs> Hang on, God. Um, I think you're really doing a great job, and I feel like I'm doing pretty good right now. All right, well, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Well, then I need to keep chiseling because ultimately you and everybody else needs to see my son. Um, don't misunderstand me, God. It's just that when I try to look more like your son, you know, people around me get uncomfortable and I don't think I'm supposed to do that. So what you're saying is that you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That's not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Uh, it's just so hard to talk to you, God. You know, everything I'm thinking, I'm just thinking we'll have a little time out, maybe a little sabbatical like Pastor Alan. You know, I'll just stay here you see what and you're going to stay there. You just never stay here. You're either moving towards me or you're moving away from me, but you never just stay. <sighs> see, what you're doing right now, this is called control. So do you want to control your life or can I chisel? No, no, no. Chisel, chisel. But can you chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, sorry. See, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And you care so deeply about what other people think. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you'll ever hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize, heavenward. <coughs> oh, it, it hurts. This hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> oh, oh, God. I... I don't think you understand this pain. Don't talk to me about pain. I know all about pain. I sent my son to die for sin and for pain. But I also sent him for something else, for freedom. You know what insanity is? Insanity is when you do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results. And there are things you've been doing for years that just aren't working. But you go to these empty wells whenever you're angry, whenever you're hurting, whenever you're tired or lonely. But they just don't work. But I'm just thinking maybe... Your thoughts are not my thoughts. But if you went to the other way... Your ways are not my ways. My God, I can't. You can't what? I can't. I can't. I, I can't be good. You can't be good. I made you good. Be good. All right. Chisel away. Just be prepared on what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because every morning when I wake up and I look into the mirror, I hate who I see. God, I mess up so many times. I'm a failure. I cannot even be who I wanted to be, much less of what you created me to be. But she's away. Just be prepared. You've listened to too many voices for far too long that were not from me. You think you're junk, don't you? You really, really think you're junk. Listen to me, I don't make junk. What would that say about me? How can I show you that my love for you knows no boundaries? Ah, I know, reach into your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Like back. Oh, wow. You know what that is? Yeah, this is the note I wrote long time ago. 
How did you get this? Um, hello? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and read it. I love Hannah. Other side. Oh, sorry. <laughs> wow. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I know that I mess up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? I felt so useless. If you take me, then use me. God, I give you all that I have. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every part of your life. And when trouble comes and chaos happens, I don't want you to see it as a prison, but as a father disciplining his child, a father who disciplines the ones but, he loves. But it will be tough. Yes, but you see, you bought into the lie that everything was going to be easy when you gave everything to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there, and I want you to say, Jody is God's original masterpiece. Jody is God's... No, 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 it's not, not the way you see yourself, or the way that you try so desperately for other people to see you. But maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Jody is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. You are his original masterpiece. God doesn't make junk. You are his original masterpiece. He wants to mold you, to shape you. He wants to create a masterpiece through your life. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, you said in your word that you will meet us where we are right now. There's nothing hidden from you. Father, you know the hearts of each and one of us here. Some of us are struggling. Some of, some of us are afraid. Father, replace it with faith, with hope. God, you said you're calling us. We know, Lord God, that you don't make mistakes. This, this morning, Lord God, you reminded us that you're the one calling us and that you want to use us mightily. And your promise is true that wherever we will go, you will follow, that you will go with us. You will tell us what to do. But ultimately, God, you want us, you want to grow us. Father, we allow you to chisel things in our life that's not from you. Remove things in our life that's not pleasing to your eyes. Give us strength. It will be tough. But we know, Lord God, you're creating a masterpiece. And it will be rewarding. And if, it's, if that's your prayer this morning, will you allow God, will you allow Him to do that in your life? So maybe this time, let's just bow our heads and just quiet time with God. A personal conversation with God. God is calling you. He's here right now. God, 
Thank you for being a good, good father. Even in our mistakes, even in our sin, you thought about us. You rescued us. You've forgiven us. Father, my prayer is that we won't leave this place unchanged. That as we leave this place, Lord God, as we come into your table, we will be reminded that we are a new creation. We are your masterpiece. That you're molding us to the image of your son. Thank you for your message this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand and let's respond through this song. Father's hand.